Good morning. It is good to see everyone here this morning. We also welcome those who are viewing online. Of course, we're going to continue our series this morning with uh, Jeff Miller. And if you've missed the first two lessons, you've missed some very interesting information, let me tell you. Uh, one quick thing, the PTP 365 recommendation for this week is from Mike Hickson learning from the prayer life of Jesus. And that is, this is a very good lesson. I would uh, strongly suggest that we view it. Before I turn it over to Jeff, let's go to our Father in prayer. Our most holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we come before you at this hour, so thankful for this opportunity that we have to study from your word and to worship you. We pray, Father, that everything we do here this morning will be in accordance with thy will. Father, we're so very thankful for Jesus, so thankful for his love for us and that he was willing to come and to die on that cross for us. And Father, we thank you for your love for us in sending him. And Father, we're so thankful for that forgiveness of sins that we have through his cleansing blood and we ask you for that forgiveness. Father, we're thankful for the church and wherever she's meeting in this world this morning. We pray that you will bless her and watch over her, protect her, especially in areas where persecution and oppression has taken place. May she always be the light of the truth of your word. And we pray especially for this congregation that we can hold fast to that truth. Father, we pray for our members who are dealing with health issues, that you would heal them according to your will. Comfort those who are bereaved, Father. Father, we pray now as we enter into a study of, that we can find the truth of your word and that we can apply those truths to our lives and live accordingly. Thank you once again for Jesus. Yes, now I pray. Amen. Okay, this has been a very abbreviated uh, seminar this weekend, and uh, Friday night we began by doing a very quick synopsis of some of the major problems with naturalism and evolution. I have an entire seminar that does that, a seven-session seminar, so it was very abbreviated. Last night we, we looked at the tip of the iceberg for making the positive case for biblical creation. I have an entire seminar that does that. Uh, today, the focus is going to be more on the idea of design uh, that we find in the universe around us. And this is a, a really neat area that is especially interesting uh, to me uh, with my engineering background, the idea of design. So we're going to spend a lot of time today looking at that idea and hopefully touch on a lot of things that you've probably never heard about in this, in this area of design <clears throat> in the universe, excuse me. So, um, Romans 1.20 would stand as a very good thematic verse for what we're going to be looking at today. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. We can look at the things that are made that God has made and learn that God exists and even learn some things about the nature of God, some of His attributes and the evidence is so clear-cut that, that it is without excuse if you don't come to the conclusion that God exists. A person's not going to be able to stand in front of God on Judgment Day and say, hey, it's not my fault, you didn't give me enough evidence. You're not going to be able to do that. It is without excuse if a person doesn't come to the reasonable, rational conclusion from the evidence, and that is that there has to be a God. And so we're going to look at this idea of design in the universe today, one of the areas that really highlights the evidence that one cannot deny that proves that there must be a God. Many excellent philosophical arguments have been used over the centuries and millennia that point to the logical conclusion that there has to be a supernatural being, a God for the universe. And these are arguments which fight, though the atheist might, continue to stand as testaments for the existence of a God. Uh, Blair Scott of American Atheists said, 
concerning these classical arguments, he said the theological arguments have not changed much over thousands of years. He said this in a debate with Kyle Butt, who works uh, with us at Apologetics Press, and he, he intended that to be kind of a jab and a scoff at theists. But really, he's right. The theological arguments haven't changed. They haven't needed to change because they've never been refuted. All we've done is gathered more and more evidence that substantiates the, the truth of these very logical rational arguments. Truth shouldn't need to change. Uh, in fact, uh, ironically, the famous British cosmologist and evolutionist Fred Hoyle, who's, this is the guy that actually coined the term the Big Bang. He said, you should be suspicious of a theory if more and more hypotheses are needed to support it. And it's really ironic that that perfectly describes evolutionary thinking. It has to constantly be overhauled. What, what Darwin originally came up with, with the general theory of evolution, is totally different from what is believed today. The Big Bang as it originally was developed is totally different today from what it was. It's had to be revamped over and over and over as more and more evidence comes to light that shows that it, it can't be right. And so they have to overhaul it just to try to keep it uh, <clears throat> as some kind of um, a semblance of a legitimate theory in, in order to d give them a naturalistic explanation for the origin of the universe is really what they're trying to do. But the classical arguments haven't needed to be changed. They've never been disproven. They continue to stand as testaments uh, against atheism. The teleological argument in particular is an argument that is of special interest to many scientists. A atheistic philosopher and professor Paul Ricci said, it's true that everything designed has a designer, right? Real complicated idea. Uh, this, but this summarizes your teleological argument. If you find uh, evidences of design, then there had to be, by implication, a designer. <clears throat> An atheist, like Ricci himself, generally will admit that basic truth, uh, but they will usually uh, refuse to admit that there is design in the universe. But they concede that if you could really prove that there's design, there would have to be a designer, because you can't have a poem without there being a, what? A poet. A painting requires a painter. A fingerprint requires what? A finger. This is real complicated. Again, you have to have a PhD to understand this, right? Real difficult. A well-known story is told of a creation scientist. Some say it was Sir Isaac Newton. Some say it was Benjamin Franklin. Some say somebody else. But regardless, as the, the story goes, the a creation scientist made this exquisite model of the solar system and the sun was represented by a <clears throat> large golden ball and the, the motions of the planets of the solar system scaled to size were, were captured with precision and, and intricacy revolving around the sun and their elliptical orbits using a network of gears and, and, and a colleague of this scientist that was an atheist walks into the room where the scientist was sitting there reading a book and the colleague walks over in amazement for several minutes he's looking this model over and all the intricacies of it examines it and he finally comes out and says in astonishment what an exquisite thing who made it and the creation scientist without even looking up from his book said nobody it just happened yeah. right and his point his point was clear was it not if atheism were true if there really is no god then that ridiculous answer should be perfectly logical and acceptable but our common sense tells us that, that that's not a good answer. And so the man, the man rightly asked, who made it? You know, who, who made that exquisite model? That was the logical common sense question. It wasn't, how did this happen? Uh, what exploded in here to make this? Uh, how, how, uh, how long did it take for this to just evolve on its own? Now, if he had asked questions like that, we'd immediately wonder if something was wrong with this gentleman, but uh, either that or we would know that he had been conditioned to think against what is obvious, what is the reasonable, logical, common sense explanation. But with when all bias and prejudice and preconceived ideas are removed from the equation, then we know instinctively and intuitively when there's design. Why? Well, because we understand that when we see something that has complexity and order and something that requires planning and intent and purpose, we know that there had to have been a mind behind that. 
Uh, it's, if it's something that doesn't shout out random chance and accidental change and big explosions, uh, then we logically know what is actually going on. Typically in the uh, first semester or so of engineering school, um, <clears throat> make sure that that's working right. All right, here we go. There we go. Typically in the first semester or so of engineering school, um, students are required to take an introductory course that helps to understand what engineering is and what the, the differences are between the various uh, engineering fields, your mechanical and chemical and civil and so forth. And there's generally a section on engineering ethics, which we hope that engineers actually pay attention in, right? Uh, and along with this intro, there's typically a lengthy discussion on the nature and process of design, since after all, that's what engineers do is design. And in these introductory courses, engineering students learn to appreciate how complex the design process really is. An effective design doesn't just accidentally happen. It's not something that's just thrown together, and it's certainly not the result of a bunch of a sequence of random events like evolutionary theory would suggest. It's not the result of an explosion in a messy room. There's an immense amount of planning and study and thought and intent and purpose that goes into a good design. So common sense tells us when design is present, it's not complicated to pinpoint something that's complicated. It's not complex, trying to put your finger on something that has this attribute of complexity. And where there is planning and complexity and design, there must necessarily be a designer. And the Bible stance on origins, of course, has no problem with that idea. Hebrews 3, 4 says, every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. This is a perfectly rational, logical statement. Christianity is first and foremost a rational religion. The house requires a builder, of course, that's, that's logical. It's a, uh, that line of reasoning is in harmony with the evidence, and it is in harmony with the Bible. So true science is the Christian's friend, it's not the enemy, and it never is. A painting requires an artist, a law requires a law writer. So does the universe, in fact, contain this characteristic of design? Well, in fact, there's an infinite number of examples from nature that we could look at that clearly show this, these, uh, the idea of intent and purpose and design, and yet the atheist inevitably and stubbornly responds with, well, I just don't see it. I don't agree. Now, the problem is that there are certain behaviors, there are certain things that the scientific community does today which contradicts that stubborn statement. Uh, atheists bear fruits that show that they recognize that there is design in the universe, although their admissions are unconscious, no doubt, whenever they do that. Most won't come out and openly admit it, but by their fruits you will know them, right? Matthew 7 and verse 20. So when you study the behavior of many of these naturalists in the atheistic community, you can identify their internal conflict and their self-contradiction. Uh, in our last session today, we're going to look, I'm going to show you many just direct quotes that show what I'm talking about, they will generally unconsciously send the message to the world that there, is, that there is decisive evidence of design in the universe and they are the ones that discovered it, is the ironic thing. <clears throat> One area of scientific study where they are unconsciously but forcefully admitting the existence of design in the universe is the field of biomimetics or biomimicry as well as your related engineering field known as bio-inspired design. So biomimicry is an attempt to engineer something, you're trying to design something, using something in the natural realm as your blueprint. So engineers are becoming more and more aware of the fact that the world is already filled with fully functional, even superior designs in comparison to what the engineering community has been able to develop to date. So the webpage for George Washington University Center for Biomimetics and Bioinspired Engineering says this, however, despite our seeming prowess in these component technologies, we find it hard to outperform nature in this arena. Nature's solutions are smarter, more energy efficient, agile, adaptable, fault tolerant, environmentally friendly, and multifunctional. Thus, there is much that we as engineers can learn from nature as we develop the next generation machines and technology. So an amazing concession about the magnificent design and the superiority of the universe around us, and yet these engineers are hardly, would hardly be considered friendly to biblical creation. But this kind of thinking is becoming widespread in the engineering community. 
And so biomimicry is becoming a major engineering pursuit. The field of biomimicry is growing by leaps and bounds with research centers being established all over the world with their express purpose being to just to try to mimic something in nature because that's where your best designs are. But think about that now. The whole field of biomimicry is actually a tacit concession by the scientific community that nature exhibits design. Uh, engineers are the designers of the scientific community. When engineers engage in biomimicry, we're endorsing the concept that there is design in nature. It would be totally senseless and a dangerous thing to do to try to, to design something by trying to mimic something that, that is actually just random and chaotic and accidental. And so for your highly educated, brilliant designers of the scientific community to copy nature proves that nature must be much more highly educated and brilliant than they are, Whoever, whatever happened in nature to make, to make uh, these amazing designs are not the product of accidents. So let's take a few moments and look at some of the recent examples of how engineers are bowing to the superior design that is inherent in nature. Uh, as fish swim, they create a vortice in their wake, a churning behind them as water reacts to the fish movement. And amazingly, engineers are discovering that schools of fish actually will take advantage of these vortices as they swim in order to reduce the amount of energy that they, that they have to use as they swim, kind of like how race cars will use drafting in a long race. Well, engineers from Caltech are now taking advantage of this feature. They're designing vertical axis wind farms using spatial arrangements from schools of fish in order to improve their efficiency. So the instinctive way that fish are able to swim in such an effective way in their schools clearly shows brilliant design. Why else would these designers want to mimic that ability? Another amazing example, engineers are more and more coming to the realization that insects function amazingly well when you consider that their brains carry less than like 0.01% as many neurons as do uh, human brains. So their ability to maneuver, especially uh, flying insects, is unequaled by engineers today. So one of the, uh, the insect features that engineers have recently discovered is that many of them are equipped with a sophisticated engineering sensor that helps the insect to keep track of its orientation and stay upright while it is flying. Ocelli are small eyes located on the heads of various kinds of insects. These are eyes that are in addition to the larger compound eyes that you can see more easily, and therefore you usually think about them as the insect's eyes. Your compound eyes are associated with insect vision, but many uh, of these <clears throat> flying insects in particular have these ocelli in addition to their compound eyes. So engineers believe these ocelli are horizon sensors dedicated to that purpose. They locate the horizon to help, the, uh, to help keep track of the insect's orientation while it's flying. Well, with these ocelli in mind, engineers are starting to mimic these horizon sensors in the design of various aerial vehicles. Engineers from Caltech and Australia National University in association with NASA have designed a biomorphic ocellus mimicking the ocelli of dragonflies in order to try to achieve a more an, an improved flight stabilization system for aerial vehicles. So again, when engineers engage in this kind of design, they're acknowledging the presence of design in the universe, whether or not they intend to. It's irrational to say, well, evolution just accidentally caused these things to happen. Darwinian evolution doesn't have the ability to, to make this kind of intentional, uh, pre-planned sort of design, these horizon sensors on the head of a dragonfly. Uh, evolution doesn't have a mind to be able to do that. Uh, another really interesting example, have you ever put your hand out of the window as you're driving down the interstate and you uh, felt the effect of the wind as it hit your hand? Uh, maybe you, you tilt your hand in different ways and you observe the way that the wind uh, will, will push your hand. And so this is the, uh, as you tilted it, you probably noticed that your hand will lift at different speeds based on 
your angle, the angle of your hand. Well, this is the same kind of principle that's used in helicopter and wind turbine blades. And you may have noticed that if you tilted your hand too far, the wind uh, all of a sudden just hit it in a funny way. It would no longer lift your hand. It would make it drop or it would throw it in a funny way. And this is a kind of stalling that occurs with blades. And it can be a major problem for any devices that use blades. Well, some scientists realized and they figured out humpback whales don't have this problem with their blades, so to speak. They can, they can tilt their fins at aggressive angles as they swim without this stalling problem happening so much and without creating too much drag. And that allows them to change their depth and orientation in the water very quickly so they can catch fast prey. So engineers went to work trying to figure out what in the world is allowing this kind of maneuvering. And what they found is amazing. <clears throat> Notice on the fin of this whale. There are these bumps, funny little ridges called tubercles. Uh, here's another uh, close-up of that. So scientists at a company known as Whale Power located in Toronto, Canada, figured out that these tubercles have something to do with the maneuverability of the whale, although engineers are, don't even totally understand yet what is going on. So the company published work in 2004 showing that blades or fins designed with bumps like the tubercles on humpback whale fins, pushes the stall angle on blades back by as much as 40%. And so the new blade design is reported by Popular Mechanics to increase the annual production of electrical power by wind farms by 20%. All right, so again, can anyone honestly deny that the universe has superior design features? Again, engineers still don't even totally understand what all's going on here. And so to claim that a feature like this just accidentally happened without a purpose in mind, uh, like atheistic evolution would suggest, is simply, it would be a blind faith to say that. You'd have to have a blind faith to just say that that just accidentally happened. <clears throat> Another project going on at Caltech, uh, the engineers there are studying the mechanics of animal swimming and flying and uh, in trying to design vehicles that'll, that'll propel themselves in the way that some of these creatures can in the world around us. The engineers have, have realized that animals are able to achieve an amazing degree of stealth and energy efficiency, and they're able to maneuver in a way that we just haven't been able to compete with by trying to design our own robots. So the Caltech engineers are analyzing how, for example, jellyfish and squid are able to do that, and we're trying to uh, design water vehicles that use that same kind of movement. In engineering, this is called pulsed jet propulsion because they're finding that this sort of movement actually reduces underwater vehicle energy consumption by up to 30%. Uh, so sounds like the jellyfish must have been pretty well designed, logically, uh, enough to be mimicked by the engineering community. Another example, trees were designed to sway so that the force that is created by wind shearing, especially at the top of the tree, won't cause the tree to just rip up out of the ground or fall over. And so this swaying feature allows some of that wind force to be dissipated, to be spread out. Well, you may have already known that skyscrapers today are designed mimicking this swaying feature. And the amount of sway that you see in skyscrapers is a matter of design, but the swaying feature is critical, especially in the very tall skyscrapers, especially as they are designing them taller and taller. Now, some of the, something you may not have been aware of is that engineers are realizing more and more that your <clears throat> conventional classic shape of the skyscraper, that of like a rectangular box type shape, may be an effective use of space but it's about the worst possible design when it comes to safety uh, with regard to trying to withstand the head-on collision with wind forces. So engineers have studied various shapes to see how these, the various shapes respond to intense airflow in wind tunnels. And so they've tried cylindrical shaped structures, which proved to be, to be way more effective in dealing with airflow than rectangles. And there are, there are skyscrapers that have been developed, which are certainly an improvement over the rectangular type model. But the constant diameter of a cylindrical shape from bottom to, to top still causes an accumulation of force along the height of that shape that is then injected into the building. And that might not be as big a deal if you're talking about a lower height building, but as you get 
taller and taller buildings, that accumulation of force can get pretty significant, especially in your particularly windy areas of the world. So engineers are now realizing that a cone shape actually eliminates the problem of force accumulation, and there, there are now skyscrapers starting to be built which use more that, that idea, kind of a cone shape with a larger diameter towards the bottom of the skyscrapers. And uh, so after all of this scientific investigation, engineers are concluding that the best shape for extremely tall structures is something more like a cone. And guess what? Have you ever noticed that trees tend to have a cone-like shape to them? So think about the, the design of the, of the tree trunk, for example. They're not rectangular, which would be pretty poor design uh, for withstanding wind. They're closer to cylindrical, which is better, but if they're a very stiff wood, they're generally not totally cylindrical. Now, a telephone pole is cylindrical. You've got a constant diameter going on from bottom to top, but trees tend to be wider at the bottom and narrower towards the top, even if just slightly at times, but still has a little bit of a cone-like shape. Uh, so that slight difference in diameter, especially for those taller trees that have, have a greater stiffness, helps to eliminate the accumulation of force along the height of that tree. So again, according to the latest engineering knowledge, that is excellent design. And not only is the tree trunk in a cone-like shape, but notice also that the leaf and branch portion of the tree also exhibits this cone-like shape. The length of the branches at the bottom of a tree tend to be longer than they are at the top, creating more of this cone-like shape. So tree trunks and tree branches make a cylindrical shape for a tree. Does that sound like good design to you? Uh, well, it appears from the latest research that engineers would have to say yes. And what else would you expect when you're talking about the chief engineer of the universe? And that's not all. Engineers are also beginning to, to be interested in mimicking the actual movable dynamic architecture of a tree. Uh, the city of Dubai is trying to use tree design to develop a, a new line of architecture that they call dynamic towers. Uh, the center of the skyscraper resembles um, a thick trunk, they say, that runs from the ground up with floors acting like branches and leaves that shadow the rhythm of nature. Uh, Italian architect David Fisher said, our buildings will follow the rhythms of nature, they will change direction and shape from spring to summer, from sunrise to sunset, and adjust themselves to the weather. These buildings will be alive. Uh, so the floors in the buildings will actually be able to rotate and move independently like the independence of branches on a tree, and the inhabitants of the buildings will actually be able to extend their balconies like little sprigs on a branch or like leaves in order to try to soak up the sun. And so notice this is a whole new level of biomimicry. So engineers equipped with the latest in technological knowledge are turning to the trees to try to mimic their movement, their shape, and their architecture in the design of skyscrapers. So again, you have to ask, if nature doesn't exhibit design and intent and planning, then why are, are so many engineers using it as a blueprint for their latest designs? If the world was not designed, then this would be nonsensical and a dangerous thing to do. Another example, you might have heard about the camera in its many similarities to the human eye. The Time Life Science Library series volume on the body said the eye operates on the same principle as the camera, the only machine directly modeled on a sense organ. And so the camera was a product of biomimicry. It was actually designed after studying the human eye. But what you may not have realized about, uh, about the camera is the latest engineering research that is taking that camera step uh, uh, even further now. Engineers have, have, been, have mimicked the size and even the shape of the human eye trying to make cameras rather than just the inner workings of the eye. They're actually trying to get the whole architecture of the eye. And uh, here's what they're being able to do. Scientists at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Northern, Northwestern University have developed a camera that mimics the curves of the human retina. And so this camera shown on the screen here looks like the human eye in its shape. So what did they find out when they designed a camera that mimics the human eye? Well, the camera can take wide-angle pictures without distortion, just like the human eye can. So how could anyone honestly say that such a thing just accidentally happened? This is, again, clear evidence of design and purpose and intent in the human eye 
qualities which indicate the presence of a designer, a mind behind the product. So biomimicry, attempting to copy nature, great idea, but in some cases it's impossible. We just don't have the knowledge or understanding to even mimic so the complexity that we're seeing in nature. So some engineers are saying, well, let's forget trying to copy it. It's too hard. Let's just see if we can harness it. Let's see if we can control it. So enter the discipline of bio-robot or animal cyborg development. These are animals that have been equipped with technology for the purpose of controlling or guiding them. So an insect neurobiologist, John Hildebrand from the University of Arizona in Tucson, involved in cyborg research. Here's what he said. There's a long history of trying to develop micro-robots that could be sent out as autonomous devices, but I think many engineers have realized that they can't improve on Mother Nature. So instead of trying to just mimic nature, his, re his research involves just trying to control it. And of course, his statement's irrational. It doesn't make sense to attribute Mother Nature with designing something because she doesn't even have a mind, of course. She's not even really a she. Uh, but statements like that show that engineers have trouble looking at nature and not seeing evidence of a mind behind it. It's just a logical thing. Again, it's without excuse to say that there is no designer. Now, one of the ways that animals are being controlled today is by implanting electronics into animal bodies, like particularly in the brain. And those electronics are then used to manipulate the movements and the behaviors of the creature. So cyborg research and experimentation using brain electrodes has been going on since the 1950s when Jose Delgado of Yale University implanted electrodes into the brains of bulls to stimulate the hypothalamus area of the brain for control purposes. You can actually still see <clears throat> some of his videos on YouTube. So since then, the, the list of remotely controlled animals that, uh, which by the way, so that the bull would charge and he'd push this button and then it would just stop mid-charge as it's coming at him. Uh, so pretty cool videos. But since then, his list of, uh, the list of remotely controlled animals that use electrode implantation has grown a lot. And it includes, for example, sharks, uh, especially your spiny dogfish, rats, uh, the University of Florida in Gainesville has even used rats for locating humans during search and rescue missions. Imagine being stuck uh, under a building that's collapsed and rats are coming in <laughs> to you anyway. Uh, but they also are using rats for explosives detection. Uh, monkeys are being controlled with electrode implantation, as you'd expect. Uh, mice, as well as chimpanzees, are being used. Uh, frogs have been implanted as well as pigeons and cats and uh, macaques and it, uh, the list could be a lot bigger. It's been a bit since I've, I've looked into the latest on that. As creepy as it may sound, cockroaches, I think they should all die. Uh, but you know, imagine what good spies cockroaches would be equipped with miniature cameras uh, sneaking into the White House or whatever. It'd be kind of uh, Cornell University, the University of California, Berkeley, University of Michigan, and Arizona State University at Tempe are, have worked on developing flying insect cyborgs, including your hawk moth and green june beetle. So each one of these instances of cyborg development constitutes a stamp of endorsement by the engineering community that the earth and its tenets are designed. Whether or not they intend to do that, they are tacitly acknowledging that <clears throat> we just can't compete with what is already around us. Non-invasive remote creature control projects are underway as well, where instead of actually implanting something into the brain of a creature, the creature is controlled in some other way from the outside of its body. So for example, MIT has used virtual fencing with GPS to track and herd cows using sound cues and shock reinforcement to keep cows within a certain area. And there's starting to be more interest in the idea of remotely controlling canines also. Engineers are realizing that dogs can travel over a variety of terrains way more efficiently than humans can in many cases, or, or even uh, particularly robots. And they're already naturally equipped with an arsenal of, of engineering sensors that, that give them the ability to detect and locate things that robots don't even have the ability to detect and locate yet. We just can't compete. And uh, because dogs have these abilities, many of the goals that are a problem for robots or man-made vehicles aren't a problem for canines. 
And so they're excellent at guarding territories and carrying out search and rescue missions and guiding the visually impaired. They have an amazing sense of smell that makes them able to detect the presence of explosives, narcotics, tobacco, pipeline leaks, and retail contraband. They're being used for that. And even cell phones and bed bugs. Well, since engineers haven't yet developed a good robotic solution to be able to mimic the amazing abilities of the canine, and we may not ever be able to, the U.S. Office of Naval Research funded a project to develop a solution. Uh, the Canine Detection and Research Institute at Auburn uh, trained dogs to be able to detect explosives, and then they trained the dogs to be able to respond to tones and vibrations that were sent by a remote control to a vest that is on the dog. It was using a Wii remote. And so from the dog's handler would send these uh, commands to the dog. So controlling the dog, not by implanting anything in the dog's head, instead controlling the dog by sending signals, vibrations, and tones that the dog would feel or hear from the outside of his body. But remote control isn't quite enough because the handler has to be able to see the dog in order to remotely control it, and he can't be too far away from the dog or the remote control won't work well. And so you can think of many situations where the dog would be out of sight from the handler, uh, like by moving behind a distant building, at which time remote control capability would become useless. So the next natural step was to automate the remote control ability and take the handler out of the equation. So just let a computer guide the dog, therefore making the dog a bio-robot or animal cyborg. And so a system was developed to guide uh, a dog to distant endpoints that we programmed, pre-programmed into a computer. And so this is a, a video of a field trial with the Auburn K9 that is equipped with the control system that I developed for this uh, using GPS and inertial sensors and a microcomputer all in the vest of, the, of this dog that he's wearing. And, and tones and vibrations which are emitted from the vest. The computer system will guide this canine to its final waypoint where he retrieves, in this case, a bumper. Uh, so this is how engineers play fetch, right? Uh, and so then it's given the recall command and, uh, and it would prompt the canine to head back to the handler. So if cyborg development doesn't prove the presence of design on the earth, then I don't know, <clears throat> I don't know what else you can, uh, <laughs> what, else, what, what else would. <clears throat> So people <clears throat> designed by the designer, designed based on the designer's designs, while at the same time claiming that those designs are not designed. <clears throat> That's a mouthful, isn't it? So engineers are forced to borrow from God's design portfolio, typically in this day and age, plagiarizing him, copying his work, not giving him due credit for his designs. <clears throat> so atheists, you know, of course, give God no credit for the designs they're ripping off from him. Uh, you know, just because it's God that a person is stealing from, does that make it acceptable? <laughs> kind of makes it a little worse, doesn't it? Uh, the atheist development of bio-robots is, 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 is just as unethical whenever they don't give, uh, it's design pirating when they don't give credit uh, to God. <clears throat> the ethical approach, of course, would be uh, as an engineer to get copyright permission for using God's designs. <laughs> by accepting his authorship of the designs in nature and then studying the terms of use that he has given to us and submitting to those terms, staying within the bounds of the permissions he's granted. And the Bible does talk about that. And then after studying and submitting to those terms of use, God should be given uh, due credit for his design. Psalm 29.2, give unto the Lord the glory due his name. So engineers... Unable to match the designs of God are forced to try to mimic them. What a testament to the greatness of the chief engineer's designs. You know, we may be able to try to fix some of the damage that has been done to the earth by humans due to the entrance of sin and, and due to all the entropy in the world. But in the words of John Hildebrand, who I quoted earlier, we just can't improve on what is already out there. The truth is clear evidence of design and planning and intent. And as the teleological argument says, where there is design, there must be a designer. Uh, God did not leave himself without witness, Acts 14, 17. His invisible attributes are clearly seen when we examine the things that he made, uh, so much so that they're without excuse, Romans 1 and verse 20. So rather than plagiarizing him, let all designers know that the one who designed and built all things is God, Hebrews 3 and verse 4. 
So I wanted to remind you again, if you haven't had a chance to check out the AP materials back there in the back, be sure to do that. Um, you know, we're responsible as Christians for arming ourselves so that we're ready to give a defense at any time. And all Christians are, are commanded by God to be apologists. Somebody contacted our office one time and said, man, I really, really appreciate what you guys do, but um, I just, I've got one bone to pick with you. I don't, I don't think it's a, I don't like what your company is called. I don't think you guys should be going around apologizing to everybody for what you're doing. We, we got, we got a little bit of an ignorance problem in our society today, you know, just a little. Uh, so, you know, we had to explain, no, the, the apologetics comes from the Greek word for defense. It's apologia that is behind that word. All Christians are supposed to be apologists. We're supposed to be ready to give a defense. And so thankfully, um, Apologetic Express was, was um, established 40 years ago or so. And the idea is that you know, Christians just don't have time to do the kind of research that is necessary to stay on top of the latest things that Satan is throwing out there that, that's, that we're having to deal with in society. We've got other things to do. And so there's this organization that, that with the goal being to get people that, are, that know enough about this stuff to get out there and do the research for you. We try to package it in a way where you can take that and have it in your library, learn this stuff for yourself, make sure your children know this stuff, and make sure that you're ready to talk to other people about these things. We're supposed to be sure to be ready to, to teach this stuff anytime. We're supposed to be contending earnestly for the faith, and that's the goal of what we're trying to do. We want to get this stuff to you as easily as possible and communicate it in a way where you can take this and use it on your own in defending the truth. So I encourage you to make sure you look over the few things I have remaining back there and see if there's anything you need for your library. And we've got a catalogs back there. We've got a website because there's hundreds, really we have hundreds of products now that, uh, that you need to get involved in looking at, making sure you have what you need. You know, it, times are different now in the church than they were 100 years ago. Uh, there's a lot of things we have to be ready to deal with. And you got to make sure at, at a moment's notice to be able to defend the truth, even if it's in some strange, obscure thing. You never would. There, there was a, there was a, I was uh, teaching a college class at, uh, at my congregation on apologetics. And, and I took some time to teach about um, string theory in the multiverse. Uh, which we're going to actually look at a little bit in our last session too, <clears throat> and he, you know, and he just didn't understand why do we have to get string theory? And then that week, he ended up encountering somebody that came up to him and tried to use string theory to prove the multiverse as an alternative to God, and he had to be ready at that at a moment's notice to deal with that. That's a common argument being used by the naturalist crowd today, and he had to be ready to walk through that and show <laughs> why that's not a valid alternative to God. So you just never know what you're going to be confronted with, and yet Christians are expected to be ready. You know, why would God send you opportunities to evangelize and defend the truth if you're going to make Christianity look bad because you're not ready? You know, my concern is I think a lot of Christians are not being given opportunities to defend the truth and evangelize because they're not ready. And you'll do more damage to the cause if you're not ready. We have a responsibility to get to work and make sure we're ready to deal with what's going on out there. And there's a lot going on, all kinds of crazy things that Christians need to be ready to deal with. So I encourage you, especially in this day and age, to make sure you are doing the work you need to do as an evangelist and as, a, as an apologist to prepare yourself to defend the, defend the truth. Um, make sure you, if you don't have our new study Bible, I highly recommend that you get one of those. We've got several different um, options for you um, on colors and leather and so forth. This, that, that has basically almost everything that we do at AP in a very abbreviated way, in, in, you know, spliced throughout the Bible in relevant places. So if a, if a college student had this and brought it to school with them, there's not many things they'll encounter uh, that they won't be ready to deal with as long as they know where to look in this Bible. So be sure to check that out and get a copy of that for yourself, any young people that you know of, so that, you're, so that they and you are ready to defend the truth. All right, thank you very much for your attention in our uh, worship hour. We're going to look at some other powerful evidences of design that are in your body right now as we speak uh, that you'll be feeling today. And then in our last session, we're going to look at um, some, some great examples of atheists themselves acknowledging 
that we're right about this, about design. All right, thank you for your attention.
Good morning. It is time to begin our worship service this morning. We are so, so glad to have you here. If you're joining us in person or joining us online, we are, we are grateful for your presence this morning. We have a good crowd and what a blessing it is to see everyone here and be able to fellowship in person once again. Do have a few announcements we'll make this morning and as a reminder, we'll have updates on our prayer concern and sick list at the end of services this morning. Uh, just as a, if you're not aware, we have a seminar with Brother Jeff Miller that is ongoing today. It does conclude this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Miller will speak uh, today during our Bible study and morning worship, of course, and then our 1.30 service. So if you are planning to stay with us, and I hope that you are, uh, we will break for lunch at the end of the morning worship service. We will return at 1.30 and wrap up the seminar at 1.30. There will be no 6 p.m. service tonight. As a reminder, the Clinton Church is hosting a gospel meeting March 26th through 28th. The guest speakers will be Keith Wilson, Alan Drury, and Sean Evans. And there's more information about that on the back bulletin board if you would like to see more about that. Uh, our Wednesday evening service this week will be a congregational devotional, so that's on the 31st. Everyone will meet in the auditorium for that class, or for that time. Uh, also, there is a family retreat coming up April 16th through 18th. If you're planning on attending, there is a sign-up sheet on the back bulletin board, and today is the last opportunity for you to sign up if you're planning on attending. They need to make the cabin arrangements and need to have that information by today. So if you are uh, planning on attending or thinking about attending, uh, please make sure and update uh, that on the bulletin board. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can see Greg, and he will be glad to help you with that. I want to uh, just take a minute and introduce our speaker for today, our uh, brother Jeff Miller. I'm going to do my best to, uh, to read through this. <laughs> Tim passed me off his notes, and, and we don't write the same. Uh, so. <laughs> but I did, I just learned that he is a graduate of the University of Texas, uh, so that immediately gave him a, a big step up in my book, as I'm also a graduate of the University of Texas, so, uh, so I was glad to hear that. Uh, Brother Jeff Miller is uh, very well qualified to speak on the areas of science and the Bible and the harmony of science in the Bible. Uh, he is a bio biomedical engineer who holds earned bachelor's degrees in physical science from Free Hardeman University, as well as bachelor and master's degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Texas at Arlington, uh, with emphasis in thermodynamics and biothermal science and biotransport phenomena and biomechanics. Uh, he holds an earned Ph.D. in mechanical engineering from Auburn University with an emphasis in navigation and control of biological systems. He has presented research at technical and science conferences across the country, has published research internationally in peer-reviewed and technical science journals, and is an active member of several science societies. While at Auburn University, he also conducted courses in thermodynamics, fluid mechanics, and heat transfer, as well as uh, statics and dynamics. He has participated in several creation geological, uh, geologic expeditions uh, with leading creation geologists studying seismites, dinosaur fossil beds, Grand Canyon, and North American caves. He currently serves as a full-time science writer for Apologetics Press, uh, as well as the associate editor of the monthly Christian Evidences journal, Reason and Revelation, and the editor of AP Bible Class Curriculum. He also serves as the instructor for the Bear Valley, Bear, Bear Valley Bible, that was the, the easy one, I couldn't get that one to come out the Bear Valley um, Bible Institute, Teaching Christian Evidences. Uh, Dr. Miller is the author of books, Science and Evolution, Flooded, which is uh, now available, uh, and Dating Without uh, Detonating, Hidden in My Heart, and various children's materials. He is married to his wife, Julie, and have five children, one of whom could be here this week with us, and we're so grateful for that. So it, it has certainly uh, been, if you have not been participating in the last couple of nights and this morning, uh, we have seen the evidence of his uh, talents and his ability to apply those talents and certainly has been very demonstrative, demonstrative in showing us the evidences of creation. So excited to have him here and look forward to these next couple of uh, lessons with him. As we begin this morning, let's open with a word of prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Father, for once again giving us the opportunity to gather here to learn more about your word to learn more about your creation and your design, Father, in this world. We pray that as we go through this uh, time together this morning, that you would help us to open our hearts and minds to do what we can to learn and absorb this information, continue to apply it and reconcile it with your word, Father. 
Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that we have in this life. We, we are grateful, Father, that you give us opportunities to share uh, your word with others. We pray that you would help us to continue to arm ourselves with information that would help us to uh, better defend the faith. Father, we pray that you'd be with those who are sick. We have many who remain on our prayer concern and sick list, and we just pray that you would watch over them. We pray that if it would be your will, Father, you would allow them to be restored to their good health, and we just pray, Father, that, uh, that you would help us to help in any way that we can. Father, we pray that you would be with uh, those who uh, are struggling at this moment. There are many who are dealing with uh, various crises in their lives, and we just pray that you would uh, help them, that you would help them turn to your word for encouragement and knowledge, and that you would help us to uh, help them in any way that we can. Father, we pray that you would continue to be with the leaders of this country, those who've been elected to represent us in government. We pray that you would uh, help them to make decisions that would allow us to continue to have the freedoms that we enjoy. We pray, Father, that, that they may uh, turn to your word and that they may continue to uh, make decisions that are consistent and, and uh, in, in line with your word, Father. Father, we pray that as we go throughout this service this morning, you would help each of us to actively engage in this, in this worship service. We pray, Father, that you would help us to uh, always strive to uh, do your will and to glorify you by our actions. We thank you especially, Father, for your son Jesus. We are so grateful for his willingness to come to this earth, to live life as a man and to die, that we could have the opportunity for forgiveness of sins. All this we pray through his name, Father. Amen. For our song be number 300. <clears throat> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, oh, what this wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, righteous angels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with Hosanna's ring. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him. Ever in joyful song. Number 180. After this, we'll have our next prayer. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How He loves me. How I love Him. Uh... 
Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we praise your holy and wonderful name. Father, as we meet to worship you, we are marveling that one so powerful and mighty as you to be able to create this universe around us as vast and and big as it is, Father, to think that you care for us just a speck of dust compared to all you've created. Father, we're in awe of you and we praise you and we meet here together to worship you this morning, to lift you up, to glorify you, to point those who need the light towards you. Father, we're thankful for each individual that's here this morning, each family that's represented. We pray that you would bless each and every person that has come here today to worship you. Father, fill us with a desire to seek your will in our lives, in our church lives, in our families. Help us be the light in the darkness for the world around us to see as we are your hands and feet, as we bring the light of the gospel into the darkness. Father, we pray that you would bless this time of worship together. We pray that you would be with us as we lift praises to your name, as we bring our petitions before you in prayer. Father, as we listen to the speaker, Father, we pray that you would help him to speak the words from your word and from his heart that will uh, help us to be encouraged, help us to grow in our faith, and help us to be about your mission in our lives. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. To help us in preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 382. Why did my Savior come to earth and to the humble go? Why did he choose a lowly bed? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He gave his precious life for me, for me because he loved me so. Why did he drink the bitter cup? of sorrow, pain, and woe. Why on the cross be lifted up? Because he loved me so. He loved me so. He life for me, for me, because he loved me so. Till Jesus comes, I'll sing his praise, and then to glory go, and reign with him through endless days. He loved me so. He loved me so. He loved me so. He
we just sung the song, Why Did Jesus Come to Earth? Because he loved all of us to be able to die on that cross for our remission of sins. Let us think about that as I read from verses 23 through 26 in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup in the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let us pray for the bread. Father, with Lord in heaven, we are thankful that we had the opportunity to take the time to remember what you did on our behalf on that cruel cross of Calvary by sacrificing your body for our remission of sins. Pray that we may take the bread in a manner that's pleasing in our sight. For I see things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Let us also pray for the cup. Again, Lord, we approach your throne of grace, thanking you for your only begotten Son, that again he shed his blood in order that we may have life eternally. Again, let us look and examine ourselves and pray that we are doing things according to thy will. For we these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we have an opportunity to give back a portion of our earnings uh, for the furtherance of the kingdom. There is a box out front that is put there for your convenience to drop your offering. Let us pray for the offering. Our Father, with Lord in heaven, we will thank you for all the blessings of life, both spiritually and physically. We thank you for our health and strength. That we are able to go out and earn a living to support our families and also to remember you on the first day of the week by laying aside a portion uh, for the furtherance of the kingdom. We pray that we may use the funds collected wisely and that you continue to bless each of us. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The invitation song for today will be number 948 after our speaker is done. Before our speaker comes, we're going to sing number 594. If you'll stand as we sing this song. <clears throat> Live for Jesus, oh my brother, his disciple ever be. Render not to any other what alone the Lord should be. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's Redeemer gave his life that thou mightst live. Live for Jesus in life's morning, at the noontide I be his. And at eve when day is turning, and inherit endless bliss. Live for Jesus, live for Jesus, give him all thou hast to give. On the cross the world's Redeemer 
gave his life that thou mightst live. Please be seated. Yes, I'm not Eric Lyons, those of you all that have not figured that out yet, but I'm pretending to be Eric this weekend, and uh, if you'll continue to pray for him as he hopefully gets sorted out what's going on with him physically, he's supposed to have an a, a appointment with a neurologist on, I think he said Tuesday or, or Wednesday, so you'll be praying for that, It'd be much appreciated. Um, as I mentioned during the Bible class hour Friday night, we did a very abbreviated look at the idea of how you can know that uh, naturalism, evolution, just does not fit the evidence. If you want to believe in that, you're welcome to, but you'll have to have a blind faith to do it. The evidence speaks against naturalism, even though that is what the dominant belief is today in the scientific community and what is being taught in our school systems. On Saturday, we look very briefly at some of the more recent research being, being conducted in, in among the creation science community, gathering physical evidences that help to support what the Bible teaches with regard to the flood. And we really only touched the, the tip of the iceberg on that. Uh, I have a, a pretty good summary of, I think, what's gone on in, <clears throat> in creation science over the last few decades in my new book, Flooded. Uh, that is technically written for teens, but you might find that of use to you. You can, I imagine the last copy is probably gone back there, so you can get that on our website if you'd like to. Today, we are looking at the idea of design, one of the amazing, powerful evidences that God has left us uh, in the universe around us. In fact, there's billions of, of examples of design in the universe, and we're looking at a few of those today. And where you find design, uh, you must necessarily have a designer. You know, it's clear from Scripture that God Himself actually instituted the field of science. God is the one that actually commanded and encouraged scientific exploration, if you think about it. Way back in the Garden of Eden, after He had created Adam and Eve, He told them to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the earth, Genesis 1, 28. That is essentially the goal of science. Psalm 111, 2, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Is that not an encouragement of science to study uh, nature, the great works that God has done? Romans 1, 20, uh, we find that you can learn about the existence of God and even some of His attributes by studying His creation. Again, that's science. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, test all things, hold fast what is good. That's essentially an eight-word summary of the scientific method. Uh, did a global flood happen? Did evolution happen? Is the universe as young as the Bible indicates? Test all things, hold fast what is good. True science and the Bible are not at odds. God Himself actually instituted the field of science. Uh, another fascinating verse with major implications for humans, especially as it relates to science, would be this Romans 120, and we've been digging into that uh, some this morning. The idea that since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly understood by the things that are made, the things that God has made. Uh, recall from our Bible class hour, uh, the idea that... Um, that we have many different classical arguments that have been around for centuries, and one that, we're, that is particularly of interest to scientists is the idea of the teleological argument for the existence of God, and that's what we're kind of focusing on uh, this morning. Recall this statement from atheist Paul Ricci, it's true that everything designed has a designer. If you can find clear-cut evidence of design, you know there had to be a designer. And granted, they will generally refuse to admit the existence of design in the universe, but they will concede that the presence of design would indicate there must be a designer, because if you have a poem, there must be a poet uh, that was behind that poem. And... Um, are you sure this is the right uh, PowerPoint, by the way? I'm thinking this may be the wrong one. Is this number two? Maybe. All right. Well, here, I'm going to find out real quick here. We're going to we're going to zoom ahead here and see. This is all stuff we covered in the Bible class hour. Ah, yeah, we're good. All right. <laughs> so remember from uh, 
So that's all review. Yeah, it's been a while since I presented this. So does the universe have the characteristic of design? I mentioned in the Bible class hour, there's infinite number of examples. Let's, let, let's zoom in on one you probably haven't studied all that much, and that is one of the amazing thermal systems that God put into effect in our bodies. Um, the biothermal system. This is what regulates your body's temperature uh, as you go throughout your day. Temperature changes that happen in the environment and your body and how the body act, responds to that. So we've all, all been in situations where temperature significantly affected us. Maybe you, you get too cold, you didn't uh, wear a thick enough coat when you went to that ball game, the temperature suddenly dropped, or you, maybe you woke up in the middle of the night and you needed another uh, blanket. Maybe you stayed out in the sun too long and got too hot and you forgot to wear a hat. Uh, maybe you were silly enough to go out and mow the lawn in the hottest part of the day. You got so hot you just didn't feel right. Maybe you got dizzy and even fainted. Uh, maybe you went to some kind of a, a theme park and, and saw someone else faint or have a heat stroke from sweating uh, so much and maybe maybe getting dehydrated from not having enough water. So what, what do we do when all these things happen? Well, we do whatever we can to kind of com combat the problem and then we just kind of wait to feel better. And then usually we just quickly move on with our lives as though nothing happened. Have you ever stopped to think about what really went on in your body to keep you from dying or keep the tissues in your body from being damaged? Uh, how your body responded and acclimated so quickly to various extreme temperature situations, like whenever you, uh, you know, how your hand and body respond whenever you accidentally touched that hot stove, or how your body quickly adjusts when you eased into that uh, hot bath, uh, you know, and, and, and you have that initial kind of shock, that jolt, and then quickly your body responds to that. Or whenever you jump into a, a cold pool and you have that, that moment where it feels like electricity hitting you, and then your body quickly adjusts. You know, we kind of take it for granted that that discomfort passes pretty quickly, and yet our bodies have done something pretty amazing in that moment. They've automatically adjusted to the extreme temperature difference between our body and our environment. Uh, but in actuality, you know, this is not something to just be dismissed without thought. This is one of the powerful evidences of design and therefore a designer, God. So thermal regulation is the term that we use to describe an organism's ability to regulate its temperature. So to keep your body's temperature within certain safe levels. And so it's kind of the equivalent of, a, of an, an air conditioning system or a heating system for living creatures. Uh, 91.8 degrees to 100.8 degrees Fahrenheit is the range that describes the normal human body temperature when you take that measurement orally anyway. But what is considered normal is based on all kinds of factors, including where you take that measurement on the body, the level of activity of the person that, that's being measured, and even gender plays a role. So it's not a hard and fast number, although many people will use the average number 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But the amazing thing is that your body is equipped with such an amazing biothermal system that the vast majority of the time, you don't even have to think about your body temperature. You can just go about your day-to-day -day life working extremely hard, being extremely active, or just sitting around being a couch potato, and your body will just regulate itself uh, to keep it within a safe range without even you giving a, a second thought. And your body does this through use of this extremely complex, complicated thermoregulatory system. This is the system that helps to regulate your body's Temperature. So the entire thermal regulatory system, as you might uh, guess, is controlled by your brain. And the processing center in the brain that controls the biothermal system is your hypothalamus. Uh, the hypothalamus is basically the thermostat for your body's air conditioning system, so it controls the thermal regulatory system. The body uses temperature sensors like thermometers or thermocouples in engineering that are called thermoreceptors, and these sensors are located throughout your body in strategic places, and they read the temperature wherever they are, 
And then those thermoreceptors, you find them in your hypothalamus, you find them in your skin, you find them in your bladder, you even have some in your eyes. And the thermoreceptors that are in your skin are your peripheral nerves, and they detect changes in external temperature. So temperature changes in the air around us, and the temperature, uh, you've got thermoreceptors in your hypothalamus that detect changes in your blood's temperature. So from all of this temperature information, the hypothalamus is able to adjust your body's thermoregulatory functions using what are called effector nerves. These are kind of like the power lines in your body that are used to communicate with various parts of your body and to initiate various kinds of responses. A very, notice, very sophisticated system that shows intent behind it. Somebody's behind this that had to design this. This is not random accidents. Now, an amazing thing is that the way that the hypothalamus controls your body's temperature is the equivalent of what is called a fuzzy logic controller in engineering. What in the world is that? Well, you use controllers in your car and you don't even think about it, like for example, your cruise control or in your air conditioning unit when you set, uh, you set your temperature to, to keep the home temperature within a, a certain number on your air conditioning system. So these are controllers, but they're not the same thing as a fuzzy logic controller. These controllers are more a simple controller called an on-off controller or, or bang-bang controller. So the hypothalamus operates like this more sophisticated fuzzy logic controller. And uh, here is how it works. So in an air conditioning system in, uh, in your house, unless you have one of the really more sophisticated newer ones, when the temperature in the house gets too high, so it gets, it gets above the, the number that you set for your system, your air conditioner just turns on, it's going full steam until the temperature in the house drops back down uh, under the number that you set. So the air conditioning unit only has the option of being all the way on or all the way off. There is no middle ground. So when the AC unit turns on, the motor is on full power and the system is putting out the coldest air that it can until the house drops back down to the desired temperature and then it just abruptly cuts off. And so the temperature profile is less regulated. It doesn't stay as close to the temperature you want. Now that wouldn't be good for your body's temperature to be so uncontrolled. Well, a fuzzy controller like the hypothalamus allows for degrees of on and off, different levels. So with a fuzzy controller, the air conditioner would be, would be on, but maybe the motor is not on full speed, so it's not blowing as much air out, or maybe uh, the temperature of the air itself might not be quite as cold or hot. So a fuzzy controller helps to keep the temperature profile more regulated and smooth and closer to your desirable temperature. It doesn't have that jagged effect. And that's important because if your body gets, if your body's temperature gets too far away from the desired temperature, you'll be in danger. And so we'll discuss that more in a little bit. Now, amazingly, the hypothalamus uses these sophisticated temperature, this, this sophisticated temperature control. If your body gets too hot, the hypothalamus doesn't just turn the temperature control system on full power, which would be a waste of energy. It varies its response based on the temperature. So it'll produce more sweat or, or uh, swell certain blood vessels more if you're extremely hot than it would if you're just a little bit warm. So if you're extremely cold, it'll do different things. It'll, just, it'll vary its response depending upon the temperature. So the hypothalamus allows for different levels of response like a fuzzy logic controller would. All right, now, in engineering, we design these controllers. Fuzzy logic controllers, like the hypothalamus, by definition, are designed. They require intent and purpose. If you have a control system, there must be an engineer that designed it, according to the evidence. The hypothalamus is a control system, so it requires an engineer to have designed it. So how could the hypothalamus, equipped with complex engineering elements, just randomly evolve accidentally by chance? So the hypothalamus, the thermostat for the human body's thermoregulatory system, is decisive evidence of intent, purpose, and design. All right, another feature of the human biothermal system. This is an, part of your interior uh, portion of the biothermal system. Did you know that uh, shivering is an actually very important intentional part of the thermoregulatory system. So as you get colder, your hypothalamus sends the message to your muscles and tells them, all right, I want you to start shaking. 
So that increased use of muscles leads to increased metabolism. So more calorie burning and therefore more heat production. Also, you've got friction there going on and heat production from that, from the muscles contacting that surrounding tissues, it'll help to warm them up. So those tissues surrounding those shivering muscles are warmed up. Again, does this sound like an accident or does it sound like there was a mind and planning behind this system? There's what's called vasodilation and vasoconstriction, very fascinating parts of the, of the biothermal system. So when the temperature sensors in your skin your thermal receptors that are there in your skin, when they send the message to the hypothalamus and say, hey, it's getting, uh, it's getting too hot over here. So the hypothalamus will send a message to those blood vessels that are close to the skin, and the message tells those blood vessels to swell or dilate. So that swelling allows warm blood to flow to those areas that are closest to the skin, which is why you'll tend to look reddish and flushed when you get hot. So then while that warm blood is closer to the surface, more blood, more body heat can be released into the air from that warm blood since it's closer to the surface. Okay, so when you're cold, the hypothalamus does the opposite. It sends a message to those vessels telling them to contract and therefore keeping more of the warm blood further away from the exterior part of your body so that body heat isn't released as easy. And at the same time, the warm blood is pulled in towards your vital organs that you need to survive. And so if the temperature stays too low for too long, your vital organs are given preference over your outer uh, organs that you can technically live without. So the safety of your fingers and hands and toes and feet, the tip of your nose, your ears, those are sacrificed for the safety of your vital organs. All right now step back and think, how in the world did a feature like that just accidentally happen? That is very, that's very sophisticated planning to make sure that preference is given uh, to your vital organs. Blood vessel contraction and dilation is another powerful example of purpose. Then there's blood viscosity. Uh, when you get cold, blood actually becomes thicker. It becomes more viscous. And so the blood flow rate will tend to decrease. And this results in less heat loss through the veins. When you get hot, blood becomes thinner. It becomes less viscous, and the blood flow rate will tend to increase according to Poiseuille's equation. So vasodilation, vasoconstriction, thermal control of blood viscosity, all amazing design features of your thermoregulatory feature. And then there's body fat, which serves as insulation, helping heat to stay inside our bodies. Now, the interesting thing about about that is that during the winter months when it's colder we tend to gain body fat we gain more insulation now that may tend to make us feel kind of bad about ourselves in this day and age but in areas of the world where people don't have the luxury of heating systems and lots of extra blankets and clothes then that tendency to get fat in the winter uh, can be uh, pretty handy so why do we gain fat? Well, for one, we tend to be less active in the winter than in the summer, and so there's going to be naturally a gain of fat uh, from that. But also physiologically, we know that the brain chemical serotonin affects your mood and it affects your appetite. So scientists have discovered that serotonin is at its lowest levels in your brain during the winter and on dark, cooler days. On sunny days, the serotonin tends to be higher. So in order to boost serotonin on the colder days, your body will tend to have cravings for sugary, starchy foods. So those foods help boost serotonin by increasing insulin, which pushes tryptophan into the brain, which in turn initiates the building of serotonin. The serotonin boost in the hypothalamus then enhances your thermoregulatory system in response to the cold temperatures, and at the same time, you gain fat from the carbs, which helps to insulate your body from the cold. All right, another characteristic of body fat that shows purpose and design and planning Scientists know that statistically women tend to have more body fat than men. So women are fatties. Uh, on average, y'all paying attention out there? Uh, look, I'm just giving you the science here, so don't... Uh, men tend to have about 17% uh, body fat. Women have about 6% more on average. Why is that? Why do women have... Uh, more fat. Well, it's partially due to physiological reasons, the female anatomy being different. 
But one reason, I would argue, is for protection. Women are statistically and in harmony with 1 Peter 3, 7, smaller, tend to be a weaker vessel than men, and therefore in need of physical protection. In fact, can help provide a cushioning to protect vital organs if a woman is struck or falls. But from a thermal point of view, the extra fat in women helps to provide them with more heat insulation for heat retention, uh, since women on average historically tend to be naturally less physically active and therefore have less heat generation from muscle movement. And of course, the perhaps the most obvious benefit uh, would be for protecting babies uh, during pregnancy. So mommy fat provides protection for the baby and helps keep the baby warm. So body fat, encouraged by serotonin levels and gender physiology, yet another amazing design feature of the thermoregulatory system. And then you have your body's composition. Our bodies have, make up about uh, they have about 50 to 70 percent water by weight. It's different based on gender and other things, but 60 percent is a good average of how much water is in your body, and that has an important thermal implication too. So water has a special thermal property that makes it handy in uh, regulating your temperature. In thermal science terms, it has what is called a high specific heat capacity. So what that means is that water can hold a lot of heat way more than, than virtually any other nat natural substance found on Earth. So water can store a lot of heat or lose a lot of heat without its temperature being drastically changed. So it acts like an air conditioning unit for your body, helping to keep our temperature relatively constant. So it takes a lot more heat or a lot more cold to drastically change your body's temperature since it has so much water in it because water is going to tend to keep your body temperature close to your body's core temperature. Now, another interesting fact about the percentage of water in your body is that our body weight can go up by several pounds due to water retention as the summer, as you start going into the summer. So our body goes through a process called heat acclimatization as you enter into the summer months and you tend to retain more water in order to regulate temperature and prepare for the higher levels of sweat loss. So again, you gotta step back and think. It was going to take a blind faith to just say to just say that all of these things just accidentally happen. Each one of these show this is something an engineer would do to try to plan and prepare for what's coming up. Now, what if your body didn't have as much water, or what if some some other chemical other than water made up sixty percent of your body? Well, it, if that were the case, then your body's temperature would be much more susceptible to fluctuation due to any kind of environmental change. So from an engineering standpoint, using water in particular and using a lot of water to help regulate your temperature was an excellent choice. And again, this shows design, planning, intent, purpose. And then there's the bladder, specifically the bladder's detrusor muscle. There are thermoreceptors in the bladder which sends temperature data up to your hypothalamus. As the temperature of your bladder drops due to being cold, a bladder cooling reflex is triggered in the hypothalamus and the message is sent back down to the detrusor muscle on the bladder telling it to contract. Now that detrusor contraction makes you feel the urge to eliminate that cooler water from your bladder, therefore eliminating that kind of that cooler uh, material and helping to keep your body's temperature regulated. Uh, those of us, those of you that were eating with us last night saw uh, my son Campbell having to run to the bathroom like three times because he was so, he drank so much Dr. Pepper and was really cold. His detrusor muscle was uh, pushing on that bladder. So how in the world does a system like this happen by accident? Now that makes no sense. It's irrational to say that can happen. Again, you can believe it if you want to, but you just need to understand you're being irrational. You, you have a blind faith to think that can happen. The logical conclusion from that is there is an engineer for the body. When you look at this without bias, that is common sense. It is rational. Now, as I said at the, as, towards the beginning, you have your interior thermoregulation, but then there's features of your body that are more on the exterior of your body that also help to regulate your temperature. So as we move into the exterior department, you have your skin, 
and on your skin you have hair, which is considered by evolutionists, at least they used to consider it more of a vestigial organ. So uh, evolutionists believe that hair was a leftover organ from our supposed ape-like ancestors, and it now we don't really need it. It just hadn't been eliminated from our physiology. But we know that hair serves many purposes, including being an alarm system. So it's a tripwire that will alert you to things that may be on your skin, potentially dangerous things. Hair also serves as a lubricant. It will lessen the friction between your skin when you move, like in your armpit regions. It serves as a filter, like in your nose and uh, in your ears, keeping harmful elements out of your body. Your eyebrows and eyelashes give protection to your eyes, keeping fallen particles out. Hair serves aesthetical purposes, adding beauty to the human head, especially around uh, the eyes. But besides all of these important functions for hair, it also has important thermal functions in your thermoregulatory system. Your eyebrows and eyelashes serve as barriers to sweat droplets, helping to protect your vision when you get hot. Hair provides protection from thermal radiation as well, so eyelashes will provide shading for the eyes from uh, harmful sun rays. The hair on your scalp, face, arms, legs helps to provide shading to prevent sunburn and skin cancer. Hair acts as a thermal insulator for your arms, your armpits, your scalp and face, for example, helping your body to retain heat. Uh, by an extra layer of fabric on the skin. Now, interestingly, have you ever noticed where hair tends to be localized on the human body? Well, we know that heat rises, so it's interesting to note that the body seems to have been designed to have more hair, more insulation in those areas of the body that heat would tend to rise to and there be released to your surroundings. So your head and armpits and so forth. So more hair in these various areas would tend to help insulate the body in those areas uh, and help us to retain some of the heat that would tend to be lost from those areas. Then there's what's called piloerection. This is a scientist's fancy way of saying goosebumps. Uh, it's an amazing feature of the thermoregulatory system. So you've got thermoreceptors in your skin, and they're constantly reading the temperature of the air and sending that information to the hypothalamus. So when the temperature readings from, from some of those thermoreceptors get low enough, the hypothalamus makes the decision to send a message back to those areas where that cold temperature was detected by those thermoreceptors. Now you've got muscles that are attached at the base of each hair follicle. The hypothalamus's message tells those muscles to contract. Now that contraction does generate some interior heat that helps with warmth, but more importantly, it raises those hairs. Now the raised hairs actually catch heat that's being released by the body by creating a thermal mat, a, a heat pillow that, is, that keeps the cold air separated from your skin. And so the opposite happens when you get hot. The hairs will be lowered. All right, what's more, have you ever noticed that goosebumps only pop up where they're needed if your body is working correctly? The hypothalamus doesn't just send a generic message to all of the hairs in your body telling them all to stand up like some goosebump on and off switch. No, the hypothalamus is able to pinpoint the localized areas where the temperature is cold and only raise those hairs that need to be raised, thereby uh, helping to conserve energy. And then there is skin pore size playing a role in heat retention. So when the surrounding air drops, your hypothalamus gives the command to start generating goosebumps. The skin pores for each hair will get smaller. Uh, therefore allowing less heat through the skin. So again, step back and think, how in the world does that happen on its own as an accident? This is proof positive of a designer. What about the fact that men tend to have more hair uh, than women? So women are fatties and men are some kind of weird animal looking things. Uh, this also proves to be a design feature of the human biothermal system. Did you know that men on average have about eight to 10 times more testosterone than women? And according to the American Association for Clinical Chemistry, the amount of hair that a person has has been shown to be proportional to one's testosterone. And so men tend to have more hair than women. And that's handy for different reasons, but from a thermal perspective, it can be handy because men tend to be larger than women involved in more physical activity. We sweat more. So how is that helpful to men? Well. 
Incidentally, one of the beneficial functions of hair is that it tends to catch and hold sweat droplets, keeping them on the skin, uh, which helps to cool the skin more efficiently, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So men sweat more, and so we have more hair spread out over our body, which will help with the sweat cooling process. So another amazing feature of the human body, which helps to regulate temperature. All right, so what about sweat then? And as I've already said, you've got thermoreceptors located throughout your body that are kind of like sensors that'll send that information to the hypothalamus, which then kicks in various parts of the thermal system to compensate for the temperature. So some of these elements are your sweat glands, all right? So if the body gets too hot from the outside temperature or from lots of activity, the hypothalamus senses this increase in your body's core temperature and it reacts by increasing blood flow to the skin, as I've already talked about, which then in turn stimulates these sweat glands. So in essence, the hypothalamus tells the sweat glands, hey, you need to secrete more sweat onto the surface of your skin. All right, why would it do that? Well, remember that I mentioned earlier that water has this characteristic of retaining high amounts of heat. So as your body's temperature rises, and all of that water is gradually getting hotter in your body. Your hypothalamus makes the decision, hey, we gotta get some of this hot water out of here and onto the surface of your skin. So then that some of that heat is quickly lost through evaporation, radiation, and convection as it comes into contact with, with moving air. That in turn leaves cooler water on your skin. Now one of the rules of thermodynamics known as the Clausius Statement of the Second Law is that heat always moves from higher temperature areas to lower temperature places. So the cooler water, the sweat that is now on your skin, which it's going to tend to pull the heat from your body into that sweat droplets and act as a conduit to quickly disperse heat out of your body. Now again, how in the world does that happen by accident? That's, I, that just blows my mind But for somebody to try to argue that that could happen by accident. That is, I think, one of the most powerful evidences of design in your body. All right, another type of exterior thermal regulation comes from behavioral instincts. What do you do whenever you get cold? Well, you instinctively do things like pull your arms in, you put your head down, you, you curl up. You tend to instinctively do things that will conserve body heat. And so we know from science that these kind of things will keep you warm. But why is it instinctive that you do those things? Well, it's like there was pre-programming involved in your body, which is, again, powerful evidence of design. Another amazing feature, have you ever noticed how your eyes tend to get they'll tend to get watery whenever they get cold, maybe from a gust of cold wind. Well, scientists have discovered that there's thermoreceptors in the cornea of your eye. So as the cornea thermoreceptors read the temperature of your eyes, they tell the hypothalamus, hey, it's getting cold. The hypothalamus tells the tear ducts, all right, let's generate some tears. So hot fluids from within your body being dumped onto your eyes. So the warm tears will help to keep your eyes from freezing and blinding you. And they also are equipped with a little bit of salt content, which is also going to make it where they're much less likely to freeze. So even the composition of the tears is another design feature. So you can add all that now to the list of amazing design features in the body that just somehow happen by evolution, right? So we could go on and on looking at just the, therm the thermal side of your body. I've only touched the hem of the garment. You could talk about how your body deals with thermal damage uh, from sunburn and blisters and so forth, or how thermal therapy can be used in healing the body. But let's just step back and, and think about some implications of what we've, what we've looked at briefly here. There is no way that these features could be the result of random processes. They show intent, they show purpose, they show design. But beyond that, think about this. If your body were not able to regulate your temperature with the amazing degree of accuracy that it does, the, the result would be quickly catastrophic. So if your temperature uh, deviates just two degrees from its normal temperature, then your health can be in serious danger. And if your temperature deviates just five degrees from normal, the consequences could be deadly. So think about that. Five degrees? That's not very much. 
So that means the human body's biothermal system has to be very effective in quickly responding to temperature fluctuations before your temperature gets very far from your core temperature. And its mechanisms have to be very effective in warding off heat and cold. The thermal regulatory system has to be extremely well designed in order to keep us alive. Hyperthermia will result if your temperature gets too high. Hyperthermia occurs when your body is producing or absorbing more heat then it can in fact regulate, and that usually happens at temperatures above 101 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So if your temperature climbs above 104, it'll be life-threatening, brain damage will likely occur. Hypothermia results if your temperature is too low, around 95 degrees Fahrenheit, and these conditions, as you know, can be deadly. So if your body temperature moves into these deadly ranges, and stays there for more than really just a few minutes, then you can have severe damage and or death. And so your thermoregulatory system is constantly at work, even this moment, uh, trying to prevent these dangerous conditions from happening. So think about that. If evolution were true, then why didn't hypothermia and hyperthermia quickly kill off all human beings and their ancestors long before the bodies could have evolved this extremely complicated system that keeps your temperature so precisely regulated? If our thermoregulatory system were not intact at this very moment, every one of us would quickly die. Uh, the surrounding temperature in here is what, 72 degrees Fahrenheit or so, and our temperature is around 98.6. So without our regulatory system, our temperature is going to want to move towards that 72 degrees, which would be fatal. So how could macroevolution evolve the entire biothermal system in the time span required to keep us alive? How could random chance even produce a system like that at all? such a complex system, much less do it in the time span that would be required to keep humans alive. How could the temperature sensors of the body, the thermoreceptors that are located throughout the body in strategic places, how could they evolve quickly enough? How could the communication lines between those thermoreceptors and the hypothalamus, your effector nerves, how could they evolve and evolve in time to prevent death? How could the hypothalamus evolve the thermostat capabilities that it has? to take the temperature readings from the thermal receptors, respond by sending messages along those specific design pathways to your muscles and to your sweat glands and your eyes and your bladder, producing tears on the eyes to protect them. How could evolution account for the temperature sensors in your bladder and their ability to determine what the temperature even is down there? How could evolution account for the power line of communication between the bladder and the hypothalamus? So think about what, what, would you, what, what use would a partially formed effector nerve have that didn't already connect the two. It'd be pointless. The effector nerve had to already be completely formed and installed from the very beginning. How could evolution cause the temperature sensors to then read that temperature, to know what to do with it, to send that information along these power lines, and then the hypothalamus has to know what to do with that information, to know whether that's a dangerous thing or not, and would know whether or not it needed to send a message back to the bladder, specifically to the detrusor muscle, and tell it to contract, urging your body to eliminate that cold or liquid? How in the world could it do that? Now, how could the hypothalamus evolve the ability to induce shivering and sweating and metabolic rate fluctuations? We didn't even talk about that. Dilation and constriction of blood vessels. How could it even do that, much less know that it should do those things and only at certain times? constricting skin pores and making goosebumps and only the skin pores that need to be constricted. So even only just one of those skin pores with its complex system, including hair and muscles, it is an amazing feat of engineering design, much less the millions that are found all over your body. These things shout out design, intent, purpose, strategy, not random chance. The scientific evidence indicates that design is the logical choice for how the human body got here and in the universe. But design requires planning, and planning requires intent, and in intent requires thinking, and thinking requires a mind, and naturalistic models do not have a mind. Evolutionary theory is based purely on randomness and chaos and accident. So God, the super mind behind the universe, the chief engineer, clearly created the human body. You know, 
No wonder David said, Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. And the more we study the human body, the more we have to admit. That is an understatement. It is an understatement. You have to just want to be a naturalist, uh, regardless of the evidence, in order to reject the idea of a God. It's no wonder Romans one twenty says, it is without excuse if you don't come to the conclusion that there is a God. If you're rational and you let the evidence speak, you will inevitably come to the existence of a God. And as I've talked about in, in other sessions, you can all have to take the next step. How do you know which God? Well, you can study the Bible and find out the Bible has... The Bible is the only book that has characteristics that are beyond the, the ability of humans to have been able to create it. It has divine characteristics, many different features that humans just would not have been able to do. And so then it's a matter of figuring out, well, what does the Bible teach? What does God expect from me? He expects me to follow the evidence where it leads, come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Son of God, as the Bible teaches, turn from your sins in repentance, Confess Christ with your mouth. And then the hardest part that, that ironically everybody in, the, in Christendom just about seems to have a problem with, the idea of baptism. You know, you know, it's not like the last step is just really hard. You know, God wants you to climb Mount Everest. And you can't trip and stumble. You have to get up there without ever tripping and stumbling. And then He wants you to ski down the mountain without dying. That's how you have to become a Christian. No, he doesn't say that. It's ironically the easiest part of the process. You don't even do anything. It's the person that's dipping you into the water that does all the work. And of course, I mean, what matters is what is in your mind. When it ha you know, let's say a brother West and I get into the, uh, get into the uh, swimming pool and we start wrestling and he dunks me under the water. Well, I've been baptized. I've been immersed. I've been dipped. I've, I've been plunged, which is what the, the meaning of the word is. But what goes on in your mind at the point of baptism is essential in order for it to be the baptism that the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about certain things that occur at the, at the moment of baptism. That's the point at which you're saved, Mark 16, 16. That's the point at which you're clothed with Christ, Galatians 3, 27. You're added to the church, Acts 2, 47. That is the point that you receive remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. That is the point at which you are making the decision to submit to the authority of God, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. That is when you're putting yourself under God's authority instead of yourself. So many things that the Bible says happens at that point. You've got to understand what those things are and then follow through and do it. And then after that, you have to be perfect the rest of your life. You can never sin again or that's it, right? No, and you know, God doesn't even expect you to be perfect. He expects you to try your hardest. And as you, as you have trouble with sin, you're going to have trouble with sin. And if you think that you don't, then you're a liar, according to 1 John 1. You're going to struggle with sin. And so what you have to do after that is you're just trying to constantly repent and make things right. You're trying to live life in such a way that you are walking in the light. You're not walking out of the light. You're trying to stay in the light. You're in a, you're in a constant state of repentance. You're always trying to repent, make things right. And as long as you do that, you're faithful to the end. You can receive that crown of life that God says you'll be able to get and all those who, who do that along with you. Uh, Revelation 2.10, be faithful even if it means you die for doing so. And that, you know, that's, that feels a little bit more closer to home these days, doesn't it? That you might die for a position that you hold. You might get imprisoned for that. You know, there's lots of things that we all, I'm sure, are feeling a little bit more skittish about teaching about. But hey, he says, be faithful even if you die for it. And you'll get to receive that crown of life. If you want to become a Christian this morning, you need to make something right publicly, some kind of sin that others know about. You need prayers. You want to study with someone here and learn more about what the, what the New Testament teaches about how to, how to become a Christian. We encourage you to come forward now while we stand and sing. so glad and free, Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Thee. I am resolved to go to the Savior, 
leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the path of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. Please be seated. 